Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us for another segment. Going to have a conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Eubank this evening. He's joining us as System Chief of General Neurology at Ohio Health in Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Eubank. Yeah, thanks for having me tonight. Well, give our listeners a little bit of uh, insight into your role there at uh, Ohio Health Neurological Physicians, and um, let's talk about these trials. Yeah, so uh, I'm part of the bigger group of a group of uh, physicians at Ohio Health that deal with uh, neuroimmunology, which for most people equates to multiple sclerosis, but we deal with other uh, autoimmune diseases that affect the central nervous system. So there's a group of uh, four or five physicians and uh, a number of other advanced practitioners practitioners that uh, take care of a wide range of patients, including uh, up until now an unmet need of patients that have uh, this particular disorder that we're going to talk about tonight, neuromyelitis optica. So I'm one of the clinicians there, and I'm happy to be part of our program. Hey, well, I appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, give our listeners uh, who may not um, be familiar with MS, uh, most of our listeners are healthcare providers in uh, some form, but um, give us a little bit of insight into this uh, particular form of MS. Okay, so most people are familiar with uh, multiple sclerosis. It's one of the more leading causes of disability in uh, young adults. And uh, MS itself is an autoimmune disorder that affects the brain and spinal cord and optic nerves. And it's uh, fairly well defined. Mm -hmm. What we're going to be talking tonight used to be considered a subset of MS, ah. uh, but we now realize it has a uh, different biology. It shares similarities to MS, which is mm -hmm. why we talk about it in the same frame, because it's autoimmune disease. Uh, but its biology is distinct from MS. Uh, the difference is actually being that uh, both uh, MS and this condition, neuromyelitis optica, or NMO, uh, cause optic neuritis or inflammation of the optic nerve. Mm -hmm. uh, they both cause inflammation of the spinal cord, uh, but that's where the similarities uh, tend to stop. Um, with MS, there's a relatively uh, frequent involvement of the brain itself, and NMO either excludes the brain or when it does affect the brain, it does it in a slightly unique way, and it generally spares the brain. Um, also, when it affects the spinal cord itself, rather than causing a small area of injury, it tends to cause larger areas of injury. And both because of that and just the nature of the disease itself, it ends up being a bit more disabling uh, mm -hmm. to people uh, than MS. So it's a, it's a close cousin, but has a different biology. And the outcomes end up being uh, a bit more problematic for people that have the condition. Now, how is it diagnosed? And as it's diagnosed, would it still be considered a misdiagnosis to class it with MS being such a close cousin? Are any of the treatments similar for both? Yeah, I know so you that's a great question. So when, it, when I trained, actually in the 1990s, there was a sense that, you know, back in the 1990s, we barely had treatments for MS, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the 1990s, we said, hey, this is a subset. Maybe we'll use the same treatments we use for MS. And what we found is twofold is the patients that have this condition, first of all, they tended to do worse than the MS patients mm -hmm. by and large. And the treatments that we had either didn't work or ironically, some of them actually made the condition worse. And what we found out over time, exiting the 90s and the 2000s and present day, is that this disease seems to be defined by a few different things, one in which we know it affects the optic nerves just like MS, but the way it affects the spinal cord, rather than a small little patch of the spinal cord, it affects uh, long lengths of the spinal cord. So when we look at an MRI scan, we talk about this thing called longitudinal extensive lesions, which is a fancy way of saying instead of causing inflammation or injury just over one or two vertebrae, it mm -hmm. might be three, four, ten vertebrae long. So the amount of damage, it's, it just looks different than what general MS does. But a really great thing that happened that made things a lot easier was they be uh, developed uh, a blood test, an antibody that is, it's called an anti-aquaporin-4, but we actually also call it an anti-NMO antibody. And so if you have somebody that is presenting similar to MS, but not quite right, and you check that mm -hmm. antibody, 
If it's positive, it defines the disease, which is actually different than MS because MS doesn't have a blood test mm -hmm. that we can reliably check and say, oh, you have MS. In this disease, if you check the blood test and you have it, you have a different disease that is still an autoimmune disease similar to MS, but it's A, going to be more damaging and the treatments are going to be distinctly different. How does N-Spring play into all this? We, there are a couple of studies, I believe, that led to uh, the recent approval of N-Spring. Is, is it specifically for NMO? Yeah, so specifically, some people notice that the, there's a, uh, one of the uh, chemical uh, messengers that we use in uh, inflammation is called interleukin-6 and it drives inflammation. And so it does two things. It drives inflammation, but it also seems to play a role in the development of these antibodies that develop uh, into NMO in the first place. So the thought was, hey, if we have a drug that can block this interleukin-6, could we make an impact on the disease either by impacting the development of the antibodies itself or the inflammatory reaction that occurs once the disease gets kicked in. And so that's what these studies were designed to do is say, hey, let's try this uh, interleukin-6 blocker and see if it improves uh, the outcome of these patients. And uh, I'll just jump to the conclusion is, is that it significantly reduced uh, the attacks that these patients had and improved uh, their outcomes. What was the traditional uh, treatment when someone was um properly diagnosed with NMO as opposed to MS. And um, talk a little bit about the cross-section of the uh, study participants. So uh, in the past, I mean, like I said, in the 1990s, we didn't really know. I mean, back in the 1990s, we just started to have MS therapies, and we realized when we threw these therapies at these patients, they either didn't respond or actually did worse than anticipated. And so we just used, in a way, kind of what we do with a lot of autoimmune diseases, we used kind of like blunt force. We used other things that affected other autoimmune diseases in general, uh, drugs like azathioprine or amuran, uh, mycophenolate or Celsept. And uh, one of our more frequent medications we might use is rituxin or, uh, and, uh, that's one that, uh, interestingly enough, does work for both MS and NMO. So mm -hmm. these were all unproven therapies, but drugs that were used off-label and seemed to have some benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what we had up until the last couple of years. And uh, the last couple of years, uh, there's been focus on trying to treat this disease specifically to see, can we find treatments that are dedicated towards treating this disease and seeing if it makes an impact. And uh, we went from, you know, two years ago having just treatments that we thought worked. And then we moved to not just one, two, but you know, three treatments, including the one we're talking about tonight. So we went from, we're hoping this drug works, we think it works, to we now have targeted therapies uh, that we have demonstrated definitely work very well and they're proven to work. And that's really a great advance for our patients. Give our listeners a website where we can learn some more about InSpring and about uh, your practice uh, as well, and um, more information about these uh, studies um, about InSpring. Okay, so you know the the where I work is uh, at Ohio Health. Our website is www.ohiohealth.com/neuroscience, and then we have information uh, on all of our neuroscience. Uh, activities, including MS and NMO, and uh, uh, we constantly try to update to get the newest therapies uh, available for patients to look at. So that's one place to look for that. There's a lot of other great sources out there as well. Great. Well, I appreciate you joining us here on the program this evening, doctor. Thank you so much. Hope we'll uh, speak again. Yeah, you too. Great. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Eubank. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen in, download at SoundCloud, and be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.